integrated care system, um, sometimes called the integrated care board. Um, it's all changed in the last fortnight, um, but uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all here today. Um, before we get going, particularly big thanks to Emma again, who's organised this series of lunch and learns. The first series was really well received uh, and second series is off to a really brilliant start as well. So I hope that you will find value in the next hour. I'm sure you will. Um, and uh, if you've got any feedback or suggestions for future topics, please let us know. Um, so we've got um, a, a really good, interesting uh, lineup today um, about how our places will change. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to, we've got three speakers, uh, Liam, Jenny and Alex, and without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Liam, if that's okay, Liam, um, and I'll let you introduce yourself and get going. Um, yeah. And then, then we'll, so if you want to talk for about um, 15 minutes, then we'll hand over to Jenny and then to Alex. Uh, and then we'll um, have 15 or 20 minutes for Q&A at the end, if that's all right. So, uh, Liam, it's all yours. Let's see if I can share my screen now, OK. Coming through. Yep, that looks good. Yep, I can see your slides. Thanks, Liam. Great stuff. OK, yeah, so hi, everyone. My name is Liam O'Reilly. I work for Natural England, which is the uh, wildlife advisor to the government in England. Um, I am a nature recovery advisor covering Yorkshire and North Lincolnshire. But um, for those of you not in Yorkshire, we do have I do have counterparts across the country who are sort of in our own little uh, network that we discuss things. So um, can link in that way if uh, there's anything of interest to you from outside Yorkshire. Um, so yeah, just want to start off with, uh, fortunately, uh, the, the bleak side of things as we, we sort of have to. Maybe some of you are kind of aware of this. You, you'll probably be aware of the often referred to as the climate crisis but also nature is in a similar similar position um in fact a lot of our environment is you know um it's, it's in crisis and actually the uk doesn't fare any better than any anywhere else in the world and arguably uh worse it's sort of one of the most nature depleted countries in the world and this is from a some of these figures here uh, in the bottom from the state of nature report which you can look up um, and the other thing just to say is that the climate and nature crisis are linked. Um, you know, some of the, the, the things that we need to do for climate um, link into what's happening with the nature crisis so we can resolve both at the same time. But I won't dwell on that much longer because I want to try and get into the positive stuff because that's what we need to go into solutions. That's where we need to be. Um, so the bit, sort of bigger picture where this fits, the, this idea of nature recovery, um, so in 2018, um, apologies if you're already aware of all this, but um, the government had a 25 year environment plan, which is underway at the moment. Um, it's worth noting that this is a government plan. It's not just a DEFRA, Department of Environment and Rural Affairs. It's actually a plan across government. It's got all sorts of environmental measures in there, but I'm just focusing on the nature recovery ones today. So we've got uh, publishing a strategy for nature, developing a nature recovery network, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, uh, goals and targets for nature recovery. This then led into uh, so the, the Environment Act. So that has, that has recently come about, that is now in place, although they're still doing what's called the regs and guidance for it. Um, so some of the levers that are in there, they're developing uh, regulations and guidance. So then that becomes a... Uh, uh, more standard practice and, and mandatory, as it were. So the, there's two two big things which are that are in there that, that I'm going to talk about today um, from a nature recovery point of view. So local nature recovery strategies and mandatory biodiversity net gain. I'll touch upon those. But just also to say there's also in at the moment there's a green paper being developed around nature recovery as well. So that that could well develop into another bill and act in the near future. Um, so one to keep your eyes out for. So what is the Nature Recovery Network? This a, a lot of the thinking around this stems from a report back in 2010, often referred to as the Lawton Report. It's called Making Space for Nature. And basically what it identified is that the reason that nature is in trouble in, in, in England, the UK, um, is because a lot of our habitats are small and they're fragmented. They're not connected together. 
So the idea there is that we need to create a network of habitats um, which is more connected. Is, is so well that the, the phrase is um, more bigger, better, and joined up. Um, so basically, we need to do more. We need to make our habitats bigger. We need to join them up. Um, but just moving a bit beyond that, the nature recovery network is not just about an ecological network. It also sort of recognises the benefits to people, and that's really crucial to some of t today's thinking and that oh, to, to what I want to talk about today is that this nature recovery network isn't just about benefiting um, animals and species, it's about benefiting us and, I, and I'd also go one step further, it's about sort of trying to change our relationship with nature, you know, trying to make it more regenerative so we benefit nature and nature benefits us. Um, it provides an integrated approach to nature recovery um, and you can play a part in this. You know, the NHS can play a part in this in terms of the estate that you have and the people who visit you, but also equally the Nature Recovery Network could benefit people outside your estate as well. So um, something to bear in mind and we'll go through a few projects soon. Um, so becoming part of the Nature Recovery Network. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, this is very much a collaborative approach. It's not the ownership of any one organisation. You know, it's going to take it's going to take government. It's going to take the third sector. It's going to take the private sector to resolve all of these things together and communities as well, very importantly. And um, if you are interested from a national point of view, we do actually have a national delivery partnership. They actually had their first conference in Middlesbrough uh, just the other week, I think it was, um, and you can you can become a partner. Um, this oh, I can't remember how many organisations are on there now. It's something like six or eight hundred that signed up to it. So feel free to sign your organisation up to it by um, send uh, email in that email that's there. I'll, I'll, I'll ensure that Emma has these slides circulate afterwards. But actually, local partnerships are really key as well what you can do with your local wildlife trust or with us or whoever it may be to to, to further nature recoveries is fantastic and i suppose the, the other big one is to integrate nature into your decision making you know it should just be a sort of standard part of that in terms of whenever we're making decisions uh, be it planning or other management decisions try to get nature integrated in there both for the benefits to nature and the benefits to people again and um, so I'll just talk about local nature recovery strategies, which I mentioned earlier, which are part of the Environment Act. So this is um, uh, it's, it's a, new, uh, a new requirement under the Environment Act to create spatial uh, strategies. They are um, actually regionally based. So in, in Yorkshire, we're expecting um, the, the strategies basically to have one in uh, South Yorkshire, one in East Yorkshire, including Hull East Riding, um, North Yorkshire, and then uh, West Yorkshire as well. Uh, we've I also cover North Lincolnshire, so for me as well, we'll have sort of part of a, a strategy uh, which will cover the whole of Lincolnshire. But it, effectively, most of them are county based. There's about 50 of them expected, and there'll be a uh, responsible authority for each one. Uh, so, for instance, the one in West Yorkshire is going to probably um, be the 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 mayoral combined authority will be the 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 uh, the responsible authority. But as I said, although they're the responsible authority for doing the strategy for pulling it all together, really they'll be very reliant on other partners to bring some of this together. So places like our local nature partnerships, which I know we do have some representatives from the health sector on them, but things like that, you know, so so think this could be something that you could get involved in. Um, to, to help shape and also it's, it's not it's not only again what you could deliver from your own land it's sort of what benefits it could provide for you your patients your service users and your staff as well Do you know is, is how we can get that integration together and the more people who buy into this the more successful it will be effectively 
Um, so there's an example here that there were, there were five pilots across the region, uh, across the country. Uh, one of them was in Greater Manchester. That was probably our closest one, and and most similar, especially in West Yorkshire. Although there was there was one in Northumberland, one in Cumbria, one in Buckinghamshire, and one in Cornwall as well. So they're online if you want to have a quick look at those pilots, see what they're. they're, they're Outcomes will kick off um, in terms of that process of developing these strategies across that area. OK, the next example I want to talk to you about was biodiversity net gain. I'm sure some of you have probably heard about this. So this is another thing that's in the Environment Act, so it's mandatory biodiversity net gain. I think it comes in in next year, autumn. I believe it's November it will become mandatory. So this is um, for planning. Um, so at the moment, it's it effectively what biodiversity net gain is, it's an accounting tool. So at the moment, although in planning we have wording around improving um, nature and the environment, it's it's not it's not accountable. It's not there's no way of measuring it. it so often, well, sometimes you can get developments that may say, oh, we're going to develop this, but we'll put in some bird boxes. You know, bird boxes are great, but it might not account for that biodiversity loss. Um, so th this is a way of accounting for that and trying to turn this around. So, so, uh, so using this example, Lego example, we start with what's called net loss. So you know, you might start with um, uh, uh, some trees on some land, which then you uh, develop with your digger there, and you turn into a building, and that's your net loss. So you've actually lost your biodiversity. And we have a term, no net loss. Which is you start with your biodiversity, you get you you do your construction, you get your building, and then actually you put some uh, biodiversity back in, which is equivalent to what was there originally, and that's no net loss. And then your net gain is all of that plus some extra. So the extra mandatory is ten percent. So that's what's in the Environment Act. There's a uh, requirement to have a ten percent increase in biodiversity net gain. Uh, it's worth saying though that in some locations that could be slightly different um, because if a local authority in their local plan wants to increase their um, net gain they could request 20 percent or they could request certain areas have more net gain but at the bare minimum we're looking at a uh, 10 percent and in fact a lot of developers are already starting to do this you know they're, they're, they're getting ahead of the game and trying to figure out what it actually means because you don't want to be in the stage where um you're trying to work this out next year you, you want to be at the stage where you're you're kind of at least being able to figure out how net game works so it's quite positive and it's it seems to be okay there's there's there are some opportunities as well so i suppose if you're doing any kind of development on your in your organizations obviously you're going to have to bear this in mind in terms of achieving biodiversity net gain and it may be something that you could use so if you if there are any building works going on around um, but the other thing is to think about is it could also be an opportunity. So if you've got something, um, I know some areas have um, land available, you know, you could become a habitat bank, you know, so a developer nearby might may want to build some houses and you've got some land that you want to improve for biodiversity. That could be an approach that you could use. And the next one that I want to talk about is green social prescribing. I'm sure many of you are aware of this. There's a couple of pilots in the Yorkshire um, area and you're probably more uh, uh, up to date with it than I am. But I just just wanted to put this in here because um, it's, it's crucial to say that this kind of approach does count as nature recovery. It's still about that relationship with people, you know, so um, building that relationship between nature and people to improve their health is is you know that is part of nature recovery and that sort of builds that regenerative relationship that those people may go out into their communities and decide all their gardens or wherever they are and it kind of improve that nature and it's sort of a ripple effect effectively so you know I just want to make clear that it, it's not all about planting trees and and as, as much as that's great and improving meadows it's fantastic and making wetlands but also that people element is really crucial to the nature recovery network as well uh just finally i think i've got uh, just wanted to mention seed corn funding there, there are sort of a lot of different funding sources around but we have small pots of funding available i can't sort of guarantee that um, any project that you have will, 
get funding but we're always interested to hear um of things that you want to do if it's sort of a small project that this might we sort of say kickstart nature recovery in your area and it sort of might be a stepping stone to doing that um so we've over the past few years funded a few small projects um so i've got some this year about uh, green social prescribing um i've just got some examples up here of things that we funded in the past so um this one up here which is a newspaper clipping comes from um project called Nature Recovery Sheffield and Rotherham, which was run by Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust. Um, it, it was a very multifaceted project with sort of community involvement and stakeholder involvement and sort of um, piecing together all of that interest in nature recovery and trying to bring it together. And they actually sort of brought a toolkit together and got um, lots of people to sign up to their, their nature declaration sort of, of a, a nature emergency and kind of bringing people together um this one here this this is a map but actually again it's it, it, it was by saint nicks in york and um, and they're doing something called the green corridors and we we sort of funded in our seed corn the 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 fulford ing sites which was a, again about mapping it was sort of a citizen science project where we got different members of the community to come in map areas and think about the kind of improvements they they could do and there was some um, on the ground improvements as well got this one in the middle which was a, a roadside uh, verge restoration which was all around our lower don't nature uh, lower don't valley national nature reserve uh, which is just to the south of York and it's sort of about joining up the kind of reserve with other areas and creating habitat corridors. I just thought I always like a hairy cow so I thought I'd put a hairy cow in there, Highland cattle and um, that was actually a project around these things called cattle collars um, which was to see how they kind of work so it's basically um, to see if we could bring on some grazing on some uh, species rich grassland uh, in an area that's difficult to fence and use cattle collars instead and again another project down here uh, which was about scrape creation so lots of lots of different ideas and it could be something else we're sort of this year the funding is very complex but if if you want to hear what i'll do is i'll pass on the expression of interest to uh, emma and you can sort of fill the form in and at least get it on there if and if we've got funding we'll have a look and see what we can do okay and i think that's the end for me brilliant thank you very much liam um jenny i'm not gonna hang around the floor's all yours okay let me just share my screen for you um, there we go just press is that, there we go. Is that showing OK? It's a little bit loud. Is that OK yep. for everyone? Yep, I can yeah. see your slides. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for having me along today. And Liam, that was a real presentation. And I feel like there's already some linkages, probably hopefully from this presentation that we could see. So that's that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to uh, thank you for the opportunity of talking to you today about the West Yorkshire Flood Innovation Programme. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what the programme is, um, hopefully to kind of ask your um, opinion of it and see if there's any opportunities for um, you as the health sector to get involved with it. Um, and I know there's quite a few people that aren't from West Yorkshire, so I'd be really keen to pick up in the discussion if you've got anything similar in your areas and how that works, etc. because we're just getting going on this. So um, yeah, any contributions and ideas will be fantastic. Um, so just as a bit of background, the West Yorkshire Flood Innovation Programme that was born from um, a bid um, across the West Yorkshire local authorities, the flood risk managers, um, they came to ICASP, which is a programme that I work for, which is based at Leeds University, and it's all about translating um, academic research to solve societal um, problems around catchment management. Um, so the flood risk managers came to ICASP and asked if we would help them with a collaborative bid for an innovative resilience programme. Um, so we set, helped them put that together in a collaborative way. Unfortunately, it wasn't successful. Um, it was a really a quite big bid, but it's about nine million pounds to do a number of innovative flood resilience projects across across the region. But there was such good like enthusiasm behind the programme that they said, "Oh, can we can we try and make it happen somehow?" So we managed to secure some funding from the West uh, from the Yorkshire Regional Flood and Coastal Committee, like seed funding, to get us going. Um, and so 
in the, that was at the beginning of the year. So since the beginning of the year, we've been working to set out a roadmap to really get kind of the aims and the objectives of the programme um, set and so that we can start on our way. So this is basically just introducing the programme to you and letting you know what it's all about. So if you would like to be involved and if you have any ideas for it. Um, and some colleagues are fed into a number of workshops that we held to kind of set the direction and get going. Um, so what is the West Yorkshire Flip? It's a collaborative programme really focusing on innovation to flood resilience and climate change. Um, so really trying to come at things from a different angle to um, promote collaboration, promote innovation and to draw in those, we call them like the non-usual suspects, so the people that don't work directly in the flood risk management world. Um, how can we work with them more to realise joint benefits across the region and to basically accelerate those regional strategies and national strategies? Liam mentioned a few that um, are designed to increase and enhance the natural environment and um, deal with those climate emergencies and everything that we are very unfortunately familiar with now. Um, so the target is we're funded to got the seed funding until March 24, but the aim is to really attract significant investment to the region through this programme to get projects really tangibly deployed on the ground. Um, so most people will be aware, but where is it focused? Well, across the whole of West Yorkshire, so the um, five local authority areas and the um, the river catchments that fall within West Yorkshire as well. So um, why do we need the programme? Um, so I'm sure everyone on this call is very aware um, of the, the wider climate emergency, but also flooding really is um, one of the key risks that is brought with climate change. So just within West Yorkshire, there's a few figures here that um, a lot of people obviously are, are at flood risk. Um, and that's something that needs to be done to enhance their resilience going forwards because it's only expected to get worse. Um, so really we're looking at, as I mentioned before, how we can go about that innovatively and try and enhance the resilience of the whole region to a number of things, including obviously the health sector. So there's just a few ideas in here as to how we could link with the health sector to realise those joint benefits. So Liam was mentioning about social prescribing, that's something that's come up with within the consultations um, and within setting the roadmap is something that would, re would really like to be explored. Um, obviously, there's mental health is a key thing to do with like flood victims. Um, again, Liam touched on it, but increased resilience for NHS estates like the NHS estates covers a lot of land and can anything be done in terms of sustainable urban drainage, etc. within those estates um, to make them more resilient. Um, and then obviously being the health sector, just increasing that flood awareness among first responders. So if the first responders were to go out um, doing their usual business, but there is a flood, how would they operate around that? So to just increase increase awareness around that as well. They're just a few ideas that we have. Um, so the benefits of the programme really is we coin the term like fairy dust. So lots of fantastic work is already happening within organisations across West Yorkshire, but just to try and increase um, coordination and collaboration to give that extra resource so people we know just are flat out in their day jobs where this programme is really hoping to, to benefit is to just help facilitate linking people up to in the end be, be more efficient um, and um, to really look for innovative ways of doing things together. So just to give extra resource to the region, like that might be bid writing, it might be hosting workshops, it might be helping to share lessons learned and evaluation ac across the region. So there's a number of things that, that the programme could, could help with. Um, so we are situated, this is just to kind of say how it's structured. We have sponsorship and buy-in by um, elected members, Councillor Jane Scully and of Calderdale is our official spokesperson um, and we're sponsored by the West Yorkshire Flood Risk Partnership and feed of over the last couple of months been feeding into a number of strategic groups, a bit like this, just going to lunch and learns and, and meetings that they have just to raise awareness. Um, the programme board is made up of mainly flood risk management um, flood risk managers across the different um, local authorities, along with the Environment Agency, Wicca and Leeds University. And crucially, we have a steering group. So uh, I think there are a couple, maybe not on this call, a couple of health people on that steering group, but we encourage more attendance to that steering group, which meets every couple of months to help steer, shape, check and challenge the projects that are being put forward under the programme. 
So I'll say a little bit about them later, but there's five main themes that we're working on in the programme, which have that flooding focus, but aren't obviously flooding in isolation. And we're looking at bringing in different angles to that. And then a crucial bit is um, basically the monitoring and evaluation and making sure knowledge is shared across all of the, the projects that get set up and get deployed into this programme. So the five themes are here on the slide, you can see integrated water management solutions. That's all about how can you be as efficient as possible? So you're not having a road being dug up and then the next week it being dug up again for drainage, etc. And um, how can you integrate as much as possible? Um, nature based solutions and um, obviously natural flood management makes has a part in that, but also it's to do with a lot of the things Liam, were talk, Liam was talking about, like how can we get flood resilience built into that and, and realise those joint benefits there. Property flood resilience is, is quite flooding focused and that's about interventions that you can install on um, properties to increase resilience, so things like floodgates, etc. Um, and then there's a big recognition that there's a lot of um, willingness and enthusiasm within the community and the voluntary sector. So how can you capitalise on that and really harness that enthusiasm and that expertise in many cases and local knowledge on the ground? And then there's a real kind of push to enhance existing flood warning systems and there's lots of technological developments around that and like warning people on the move etc and warning transient populations that might not be uh, residents within a certain areas to to their um, exposure to flood risk during an incident so there's there's quite a focus on that as well um we really want to work by these overarching principles. So really like empowering, looking to develop skills and capacity and transfer knowledge across the region. So they're the principles that, that we're gonna be working by. And then this is really like how, how will the programme deliver these tangible, uh, the, deliver the aims and the principles. And this was basically informed by a number of workshops we did with a number of, I'm not sure if anyone directly on the call here today was part of them, but there was the healthcare sector did feed into this. Um, so delivering tangible work, like we really want to be the positioned to do the doing and deliver these action plans of all these regional strategies. So um, there's a recognition that there's opportunistic projects, but there's also strategic projects and that we can we can work in both both places. Partnership working, so that little star on this one as well. So we want to build on existing relationships, but also develop new relationships. We want to be able to speak a common language and to um, really be able to um, work together to, to get stuff done, basically. So this is hopefully where you might like to feed in as well. Um, the kind of uh, beauty of the programme, because we are a collaborative programme and people are part of it from lots of different types of organisations, is that lots of different organisations by who they are might be might be able to qualify for different funding pots. So it gives us that kind of um, opportunities across across different funders and um, to be able to apply for for different pots that in isolation you might not qualify for example, for example. So obviously there's the academic side of things and um, there's the local levy side of things and um, basically cross sectoral funding. So just just to make that point there. Um, and then we've thought about like mechanisms as to how we would share knowledge. So we, this is a really important thing for the programme to make sure that we do enhance the resilience of the region, but also like increase the capacity of the region as well. So there's been some thought into like mechanisms as to how to how to share the knowledge. Um, and then again, that monitoring and evaluation, I think leads will play um, quite a key key role in that. This might be a bit small on your screen, but this is just to give you an idea of who took part in these initial consultations and workshops. So you can see in the community and voluntary sector kind of area, there's quite a lot of, or there's two or three health focused people there, the Health and Care Partnership, um, ooh, the Leeds Mental Wellbeing Service, and there was another one, I think. Anyhow, you could probably see for yourself, but um, yeah, we've had lots of people involved and bought into this, which is really fantastic. Um, so these are just a couple of quick slides, but just to show you um, under those key themes, we did um, an exercise where we asked the people that came along to those workshops to really um, identify the opportunities and the challenges. So you'll see um, building on existing partnerships is a really big one. Enabling multiple benefits was huge as well um, by taking systems approaches to things and um, mapping um, opportunities and evidencing multiple benefits. Um, which then kind of fed into the, 
the planning and long term management of nature based solutions. Um, but also there was a real, real strong steer about linking with the health sector and enabling health and well-being benefits to be realised through nature based solutions. Like this just came up time and time again. So that's why I was really excited to get the invite to come along to this meeting to just let you know that kind of the flooding world is looking at you guys and wanting to join up with you. Um, and then thinking a little bit more about like the um, PFR and early flood warning systems is there's a real desire to influence the, in, uh, the insurance industry um, and to enable access to um, property flood resilience resources. That's that's an issue about access. And um, so lots of work in that area as well. Um, the programme wants to do. Um, so based on kind of this initial activity um, and the, the roadmap that we've created, we've actually done quite a lot of work off the back of that. And one of the really exciting things that we have is at the moment we have some applications in with um, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority for research and revenue projects. And one of them is specifically um, wanting to focus on the link between social prescribing and um, flood resilience activities. So Liam was mentioning before, like, how can you link up the two services or all well, this the social prescribing with um activities like tree planting natural flood, uh, natural flood management activities um to make it like a win-win-win situation so that's the project that's looking at how that that could possibly be done in terms of um operate upper upper operation can't get my words out it's the end of the week um trying to get that set up basically so it'd be really interesting to link up to see what's already been done in this space and how we could potentially help if this funding comes through to to advance that um and like i said before we have established a governance and ways of working so we've got a board and a steering group so anyone on this call be very welcome to to come along and be a member of that steering group um, and we're just finalizing like the terms of reference and things to that now but um we're really keen to to use the steering group really objectively to check and challenge, to bring ideas and to really make sure that collaboration and innovation happens. And it's not just like tag words on the on the title of the programme. Um, and this is just basically a conclusion. Um, if everything that I've already said. <laughs> so in the interest of time, I'll probably just let you let you read that um, and happy to take questions now or if you want to carry on through and more than happy to to take questions and discuss afterwards. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jenny. It's really great to hear from, from you, to hear your enthusiasm. I think um, from my conversations on the health and social care side, I think there is willing to be involved, willingness to be involved, and um, capacity is often an issue, but that doesn't mean that we're not engaged. Um, anyway, uh, let's keep moving because I'm keen that we have some time for questions. Um, Alex, I'm going to hand straight over to you, if that's OK. Thank you, Frank. And uh, thanks, Jennifer. I might nick the, the fairy dust thing. I think that's a really uh, lovely phrase, probably that encompasses all of the the um, variety of broad range of things that we do. Oh, I've just shared the wrong screen because I'm trying to talk and work technology at the same time. <laughs> Forgive me, nearly there. Uh, here we go. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, thanks, yeah. Alex. Great. OK, good. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you so much, uh, Frank and Emma, for your very warm welcome today. So my name's Alex Botchell and I work for Sustrans as programme lead for livable cities and towns for everyone. I recently moved to Manchester from Bristol, but have also previously worked in Elgin, Northern Scotland and Edinburgh, uh, both for Sustrans as well. I'm an urban designer by profession and have uh, been working in the field for about 10 years, working on public realm improvements, neighbourhood redesign projects and major infrastructure projects. I've also worked on the private sector as a master planner on regeneration schemes, residential mixed use and town centre vitality strategy. So it's really interesting to get a broad perspective on lots of these different areas. Um, Liberal cities and towns for everyone is one of Sustrans two strategic objectives, the other one being paths for everyone, uh, which encompasses our legacy of building the national cycle network. And as you may have already noticed, the for everyone or inclusivity is core to both of our strategic objectives. So our vision uh, is related to a rapidly increasing understanding of the full effect of vehicles on people. We've primarily seen cars as convenient, connecting, comfortable and economically advantageous. 
But actually, after 70 odd years of car centric policies, planning, investment and design in our cities, towns, villages and countryside, actually, we are only just beginning to unveil the true effects of these things on on people, on humans. And we've got increasing evidence that people suffer the most from the effect of cars, uh, vehicles and traffic um, when they're the most marginalised in, in other ways. So transport in the UK increases inequality at the moment, and we believe that with the right changes, it doesn't have to be the case. It has the ability to reduce inequality. So our vision is for a society where the way in which we travel creates healthier places and happier lives for everyone. So our urban work is built around the problem we're here to fix. It's something that we as Sustrans have found difficult to talk about in the past because we're saying something that has been quite counterculture, uh, but with increasing, <clears throat> excuse me, increasing awareness of the environmental uh, health and resource issues, not to mention scarily uncharacteristic heat waves, as we saw at the beginning of this week. Uh, we're certainly, I think, seeing a new openness to embrace the messages that cars may not as, be as brilliant as society once saw them. And kind of add this to the context of the global pandemic where streets in cities and towns across the UK were closed uh, for traffic to allow tables and chairs to spill out into the outdoors, which obviously boosted struggling businesses, but also allowed people to socialise in a lower risk context. And I think we, we have a situation where new thinking can emerge, where people can rethink the way they have considered these topics before. Um, people see things in a different way. So the problem we're here to solve in our livable cities and towns for everyone's strategic objective is that most places are designed around cars and not people. Um, and car use and the space cars occupy make it difficult for people to live and move well together. Uh, places are dominated by the journey between A and B. And as I said on the previous slide, the way we travel or are forced to travel is disproportionately affecting the poorest and the most vulnerable in our society. So despite the human and environmental costs, investment and policy overwhelmingly still support unjust and unsustainable ways of travelling around the places we live. We're seeing some change to that, but it's very, very slow and not nearly enough. Sustrans overall mission is simple. We're here to make it easier to walk and cycle and we understand our work next to other transport focused organisations, particularly public transport operators, so that multimodal journeys can be effectively linked cycle parking at stations for a very quick example. And we also understand our work next to non-transport organisations, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute. But what's our vision for change in cities and towns? So it's to create places that connect us to each other and to what we need, where everyone can thrive without having to use a car. And this goes way beyond the physical connection and infrastructure. This is also about being grounded, about being rooted and informed and involved in decision making. So our vision for change is actually really simple enough to understand, but quite difficult or sorry, quite involved to achieve. This is challenging to achieve because there are so many layers of history, culture, decision making, um, expectations, political fragmentation and commercial inertia uh, to unpick. But as I say, our vision is really simple and clear and the evidence base to support it makes these changes I uh, mean, making these changes is rapidly growing in quality and quantity. Um, so car dependency is the reality too uh, for so many people. And I grew up in a small community where car dependency is likely to remain an issue for a long time to come. There's no good public transport alternative. Um, but I think as, as an organisation, we have to be quite careful when working to see change happen, not to alienate the very people we seek to influence. So what does Sustrans say makes a livable city or town for everyone? I'm just going to read these off one by one. Um, so the first one is social connection at its heart, livability, social connection at its heart. Uh, two, it has most of what you need just a short walk away. Three, has roots and celebrates its unique character. Four, is easy for everyone to move around healthily in. And five has clean air and green space for all to live and play in. And you can probably tell just just having a quick look at that uh, list that the things that Jennifer and Liam uh, raised, there's a lot of overlap there. And I'm glad that we've got uh, something like this to, to guide our strategy in Sustrans because we want to break out of that kind of transport industry silo of looking at things and, and embrace a sort of wider, um, more reflective of society language and discourse around these things. So 
uh, just one more bit of theory before discussing 20 minute neighborhoods, which is the main thing I wanted to talk about today. Uh, SOSTRANS is moving towards a place based approach. Um, and I think that's a particular opportunity to build partnerships with organisations such as the NHS and the other two mentioned today. And we are already involved in social prescribing projects, amongst other things. I think there's a clear synergy that joins us, the NHS and so many organisations in what we're here for. And taking a place based approach is an emerging theory of how we can work uh, together to build the best um, outcomes for community, especially communities, sorry, especially when those um, uh, some of those communities might feel like they have a, a sort of history of having stuff done at them or to them rather than with their core involvement. I'm not going to read the definition because it's a bit fiddly now and I'm aware time's short. So um, so uh, that was just a bit of theory and strategy and an overview of some of the context in the livable cities and towns for everyone work. But here's something more tangible about our work. Um, we've got over 2,200 urban projects across the UK this financial year with a range of approaches that aim to redesign places, uh, to equip people, to train people and to provide infrastructure. And while I won't go into too much detail on it, we do have colleagues as well dedicated to working with the UK and devolved governments across the UK to ensure good policy decisions are made on urban issues. But our role is primarily focused on having most of what you need just a short walk away, which is where people should have the ability to meet most of their everyday needs within an easy and attractive walk of their home. This is what we mean by the 20 minute neighbourhood principle. Um, and alongside that, access to cycles and cycle infrastructure uh, and affordable public transport should serve longer journeys for when walking isn't suitable. But the 20 minute neighbourhood or the 15 minute city, they're kind of the same thing with just slightly different descriptions around them. Um, they're not a new, they're not new concepts. So uh, from the 1920s, when an American urban planner, Clarence Perry, Perry uh, proposed the idea of the livable neighbourhood unit before the mass influx of private cars and city zoning um, arrived later in the 20th century. And Paris is undergoing a transformation now. Uh, the mayor of Paris um, and Hidalgo, I'm probably not pronouncing that quite right, uh, but uh, is working on her vision for Paris as a collection of neighbourhoods. So she's appointed a commissioner for the 15 minute city with a aim to create a city of proximities, not only between structures and green spaces, but people as well. So Melbourne has adopted a long term strategic plan for 20 minute neighbourhoods, which isn't just about transport and access to services, but includes improvements to streets to make them greener and safer and access to parks and playgrounds. And this very much links, I think, to what uh, Liam was saying about um, networks for wildlife and ecology. Um, so, so there's a, a kind of a, a common theme there for sure. I was fortunate enough to study in America as part of my, my UK planning degree. Chicago um, as a flat gridded city where I was based is extremely permeable. There are lots of different routes to get through the urban area. Um, however, even when street permeability is good and density, um, sorry, density and the concentration of amenities needs to be right. But as is so common in US cities and globally in suburbia, um, the, the human scale is severely lacking both in the large block sizes and also the distribution of amenities within the gridded streets. So it was really interesting for me to compare my home village, which uh, entirely fits into an 800 made, uh, meter radius of the center with my neighborhood in Chicago. I think the most interesting thing there is that uh, there's an abundance of physical space in Chicago uh, to be able to incorporate all of the shops, services and amenities that my village had and then some. But the sort of the pervasive automotive scale of everything in the city means that people just won't be on foot in an area like that to begin with. So there's no easy way to get the critical mass of shops and services needed for people to be able to move and get out of their car and move more locally, walking and cycling. But it's not a bed of roses here either. Um, on the topic of suburbia, this is a ticking time bomb, I believe, for most UK cities and towns and beyond. So here's an illustration of a, a fairly typical development pattern. It could be any city or town in the UK. This would depict a small town on the screen here, but you could scale this up to our largest cities. A bit oversimplified, but you've got the medieval core in pink at the beginning, uh, at, sorry, at the centre of this, this town. Then you've got the deep orange, which is Victorian streets. Uh, light orange, which is interwar development, 
a cream colour which kind of reflects cul-de-sacs from 1980s onwards and then yellow out of town developments supermarkets retail parks and so on and then the red sort of areas they they are, are just representative of potential development sites even if oh i've gone on one, one wrong side there where am i excuse me um even if subsequent development mimics the more sort of pre kind of car layout in line with current policy and best practice with permeable neighbourhoods of streets suited to human scale movement. If urban cores or local centres have been insulated against sustainable direct people powered movement with cul-de-sac development, we'll struggle to ever make a meaningful difference to those contexts. This is deeply challenging for us as Sustrans. Um, you can imagine the, uh, the, the cost would be astronomical of you know breaking roads through and compulsorily purchasing um people's gardens to build a, a suitable network of streets it's just not going to happen um i'm aware of time i'm actually going to probably end on this slide and not go into the more detailed examples here just just um because we just don't have time today but just to, to finish on this one the 20 minute neighborhood concept is very simple to understand so it's having most of what you need just a short walk away but complex and tricky to work towards, even though it's simple to understand. And notice I say work towards rather than achieve or deliver because it's way too involved for any one organisation to reckon they've just done it. Um, so it's like a jigsaw with bits missing and bits lost forever. So the missing pieces are the issues that for us as Sustrans or planners or architects or engineers that we cannot address in isolation um, and working together is essential. So an example of this um, is that from our perspective is that a community might need better uh, provision of shops to give people the choice to buy food without having to drive to a supermarket. And yet it's high business rates or rental costs that could make opening a local shop or business commercially unviable. So these jigsaw factors go far beyond the physical design or planning of space, which is why we need to work with other organisations to make this stuff happen. I could continue talking for quite a while, but I know the time's really short um, and I'm, I regret I've not got time to, to give you the project examples, but I can share my slides uh, later for that. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, that was that was fab. Um, fab from all three. Uh, I'm going to uh, just before I open on to questions, I feel like I should make a confession, um, which I'm making now rather than before Alex's chat, which is that I'm a trustee at Sustrans. Um, so uh, it's not a conflict of interest, but I like to be really transparent about these things. Um, so uh, I'm going to open to questions. I've got a hand up from, is that Sarg? Oh, Sarg, you came off mute and went straight back on again. Oh, oh there you go. Yeah. No. Yes, hi. Thank you. Um, uh, Alex mentioned about ticking time bombs. And my question is something I've been mentioning to people in the sustainability space for a long time, which is my, my knowledge and interest of supply chains going all the way back to India and Africa. Uh, because when I spoke to some people about scope one, two and three, scope one and two is the building that I'm in, scope three, 80% of the scopes is going to be in the countries of the origin of the materials, um, that being India, Africa, China. And my real thorn in the side in sustainability is this massive push for renewables, for the lithium and the cobalt and the bauxite, that we are, we are requiring this lithium for the cars, but we're not going to really have that many cars because we're not going to be using them. So why are we digging up these materials in the first place, which a lot of people do not comprehend. To get those resources requires a lot of coal and it requires upturning a whole forest. And I've propositioned this to a lot of people in the UK that um, the HS2 that the government was saying, let's just that, imagine that is your house, but it's to get the resources from somewhere like Cornwall to get the minerals for a wind turbine. They're, they're all of a sudden aghast. And I was like, look, this is already happening. My question is, what I've been proposing for the last 10 years is instead of putting the greenery around the building in terms of trees, um, why don't we look at as a base layer making the buildings themselves out of the biomaterials that are already growing 
all parts of the UK and Ireland. And the supply chain is literally going to be, what, 50, 100 miles from the farm to the manufacturing to the place where you build it. And that's something I've been working on myself as a project. And then I saw the different speakers' talks here, and I thought this is a good opportunity to maybe um, learn more about the projects and also use my knowledge of the supply chains in India and actually saying this is a reason why we should not, why we should be looking at the stuff in the UK because the supply chains of those resources from India are looking even less tenable for us in the UK and how we should look at, you know, UK specifically, you've got hundreds of kilos of hemp um, being burnt because it's the onus on the farmers from the government to burn it. I was like, every single gram of the hemp should be used. So I'm, I'm working on a project to do that, but how to actually not just use the waste, but how do we bring back hedgerows in the UK, which I understand hedgerows were made, were grown for no other purpose then to actually sit there and sequester carbon and they were grown from industrial hemp. Um, so, um, yeah, how do we bring these things back, which were indigenous to the UK, but also um, make sure we're not too reliant on the externalities, which is outside of Europe? OK, thanks, Sarg. Um, does do any of our speakers uh, have any comment on that? Alex. All right, Sarg, thank you very much. That's a really interesting set of ideas I think you've just shared. And I think um, in, in short, the, um, the, the thing that I would say is so important is um, innovation uh, and creativity in trying to solve these problems. We have a, an economic system um, where wages are different, obviously, in different places, which kind of supports not the most greenest way of doing things. Um, but yeah, we have to look at all these things in a joined up matter, which it sounds like you already are. <laughs> um, and, you know, um, I mean, just to give one really brief example, I know there's um, there's a move towards creating cycle uh, paths out of recycled plastic or rubber, I believe it is in the Netherlands. Um, and, and that's just an example from the transport industry of what we need to see a lot more of. So I think you're absolutely bang on in what you're identifying as issues, big picture issues. Yeah, um, my project is on biomaterials for roads, but um, so, so I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm I'm aware that we're very short of time. I've got some other questions to come. Sure. So could we maybe pick this up um, offline? Yes. Uh, thank you. Sorry, Emma. Um, thank you. Um, I suppose a question for all of the speakers is because um, a call that I had just before this lunch and learn was to do with our climate change adaptation plan for Bradford and Airedale. And um, so just thinking about with your different hats on how how we can ensure sort of flood resilience, the 20 minute neighbourhoods, the nature recovery stuff can be included in our adaptation plans um, and what you might want us to try and include within a NHS adaptation plan? Yeah, I'll I'll give it, I'll give I'll give it a go very briefly <laughs> with the time that we've got. Um, uh, so adapt obviously adaptation, you know, I mean it's sort of a it's a thing, isn't it? It's not just the new normal, what we've seen recently, it's actually probably one, gonna be one of the coolest summers of the next two hundred years, which is quite a frightening prospect. Um, but, you know, in terms of nature, you know, nature can play a real role in terms of adaptation and helping us. I think I think some people have concerns about fuel loads, but I often think about kind of if we're going to be uh, meeting things like drought, which a drought um, is actually drought and, and low river flows and wildfires proportionately going to increase under climate change more than flooding. But actually, interestingly, some of the nature based solutions around both flooding and drought are the same thing, which is basically wetlands. You know, so although uh, woodlands definitely will play a, a big role in terms of cooling and also they help sort of retain moisture in the area. So there's sort of longer grasses and sort of doing that kind of, you know, reducing the amount of heat that can build around buildings. I also think the wetlands are going to play a really key role in this. So when I say wetlands, I mean things like ponds, you know, it could be as simple as that, or it could be sort of a more marshy grassland. But if you think of those as kind of a fire break, but also a source of water 
if you have a fire and you need to put that out on site but equally you kind of get that benefit of having nature on the site that people can use and it's only there if it's a, a case of an emergency so it's thinking like that it's kind of trying to think about how we can reduce risk and and and, and improve things for people so I think mine would be to just um, raise awareness of other really similar work that is happening in the region at the minute. So um, just to, I guess, help link up and help to not have to reinvent the wheel. So everyone has to start from the beginning. So um, Lead City Council, they're doing a climate change adaptation plan as well. Um, and I'm just actually about to start on the university's the University of Leeds Climate Change Risk Assessment and Resilience Review. So there's a lot of work going on in this space in very close proximity to what you're doing. So um, in terms of like assessing risk and um, evaluating that risk and thinking about resilience options and adaptation options, just to, to make you aware that there is like a lot of other work going on as well. So um, if you want to link up with that, then um, that might just be beneficial um, just to help everyone along along the same journey basically so happy happy to to share what I know basically um, and to link in with the Yorkshire Humber and Climate Commission if you're not already and just yeah just all the other groups that are around I think that would be really beneficial in helping you along. Thanks Jenny. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Um, if, if not just as a sort of final wrap up for the last two minutes um my question and I'll, I'll pick on you each in turn if i may um would be if you if you had a um some of that um fairy dust or, or a magic wand uh, and you had um, a um one wish or a couple of wishes um what would you really like to see happening in the next 20 years you know or what would life look like in in 20 years time just in a sentence or two um, but I think it's the reason I ask is because I think it's really important that we can visualize the future that we're working towards. Um, and, you know, don't worry about cost, don't worry about politics, any of that. You know, it, you're king for a day uh, with your magic wand. What's it going to look like? Um, and Liam, I'm sorry, but you're in the hot seat first. Yeah, you pick it on me. That's fine. Um, OK, I'll give it a go. So I think from my point of view, what, how I look at this is actually linking those kind of social and uh, environmental things together. So actually the, the resilience of our environment is actually related to the resilience of our of our communities and our societies. And actually what what there's no sort of one single single silver bullet other than to say is to what we need to do is to grow both the resilience of our communities and society which will in turn feed into a sort of a regenerative relationship about growing kind of nature and and, and improving our environment i know it's a little bit sort of no i can't right. sort of give you exact like hectorage or something no, like no, that but it's more fine. it's more about that relationship and that and almost how we kind of view things and build in that together jenny um I'm not going to say anything probably much different to that. Um, I would say that it, for me, it's taking like everyone along the journey together. So, yeah, that link between the social and what act, the social environment, the economic environment, the physical environment, just bringing everyone together as much as possible. So for me, like the, the journey of that is really important. And that's, I guess, where our programme is trying to help is like figuring out how to do it and trying to um increase capacity, increase efficiencies, get everyone working together as as, if, as best we can to transition ourselves towards that net zero, towards that adaptation, increasing resilience. So for me, it's just making the process as successful as it can be so we, we can make that a reality in 20 years. Hopefully, Brilliant. imagine Thank 20 you. years, that'd be great. Have it sorted. <laughs> and we'd all be out of jobs. Alex. <laughs> Absolutely. I um, totally agree with you, Jennifer, about working together um, and that's a means to get there, I think. Um, I suppose uh, a vision I've got is um, for uh, the evidence of a system thing changing. Um, in the news two or three weeks ago, there was a, a celebration of Spaghetti Junction in Birmingham. Um, you might have seen it and it was all great and how how brilliant it was that this piece of infrastructure that's pretty ugly um, has existed for so long. And I just thought, when is it we're going to 
it's going to dawn on us. Even with electric cars, there's all these pollutants raining down from brake dust. But obviously with motor vehicles, it's worse. Raining down on the good people of Birmingham. And that's just a kind of one example of the kind of culture change we need when we're actually going, we don't want this anymore. That's it. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much um, for three really good talks, great answers to questions and three really um, wonderful visions to think about um, going forward. Uh, we're fractionally over time. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, I can see that um, Emma's posted that the next session will be on the 9th of September about what to do next once you've got your heat decarbonisation plan. Uh, I hope you can all make it then. Please spread the word um, and uh, that'll do for now. Thank you all very much. Thank you for having me. Yes, thanks for inviting me. Bye now. Have a great weekend. Thank you.